الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا وامامنا وقدوتنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته dear brothers and sisters welcome to our weekly lesson on the explanation of kitab at tawhid alladhi huwa haqqullahi ala al-abid by shaykh al-islam al-mujaddid al-muslih muhammad ibn abdul wahhab ibn sulaiman at-tamimi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi rahmatan wasi'ah and as we mentioned the first couple of minutes we dedicate to learn the lineage of our noble prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So let's have a quick recap Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn ibn Abdul Muttalib and after that what do we have dear brothers and sisters who is after Abdul Muttalib in the lineage Ibn Hashim ahsant and after Hashim who's after Hashim Hashim was the son of who? Abd Manaf. Abd Manaf. Naam. So Muhammad, after Abd Manaf, who did we take last week? We took a new name. Abd Manaf was the son of who? Uh, nobody remembers after Abd Manaf. Qusay. Qusay. So after Qusay, today we're going to learn a new name in the lineage of the Prophet Sallam. Qusay was the son of who? Anybody know the next name? Hilab. Naam, ahsant, mashallah. Naam. So we have Abu Al-Qasim. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wah um, sorry Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abd Manaf ibn Qusay ibn Kilab alhamdulillah we have reached the seventh name so inshallah we will eventually get there okay alhamdulillah tayyib now moving on to kitab at tawhid we have taken approximately first half of the second chapter which is babu fadl at-tawhid wa ma yukaffiru min adh-dhunub the chapter of the virtues of tawhid and its expiation of sins and we took the saying of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the the, the ayah alladhina amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bi dhulm ulaika amnu muhtadun and then we took the hadith of uh, ubada ibn as-samit radiyallahu ta'ala an Now we move on to the second hadith and the third proof the third proof which is the second hadith in this chapter the author rahimahullah he says wala huma fi hadith itban radiyallahu an fa inna allah harrama ala an-nar man qala la ilaha illa allah yabtaghi bi dhalika wajh allah So again in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of the noble companion Itban ibn Malik al-Ansari radiyallahu ta'ala an the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden has forbidden the hell fire for the one who says la ilaha illa allah none has the right to be worshiped except allah yabtaghi bi dhalika wajh allah seeking by it the face of allah tabarak wa ta'ala 
Now, something interesting here is that this noble companion, Itban ibn Malik al-Ansari radiyallahu an al-Badri. He is from the Sahaba who participated in the Battle of Badr. Until now, all of the ahadith that Sheikh al-Islam has mentioned in Kitab al tawheed which I believe are four, all of them have been narrated by a companion who participated in the Battle of Badr. Who can remind us of the first Sahabi that he mentioned in the first chapter? In the first chapter, he mentioned two. Who was the first one he mentioned? Naam, Ahsant. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an. And then in the next hadith, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyallahu ta'ala an. Naam. Exactly. Okay. Ahsantum. Both of these companions are participating in the Battle of Badr. Then in this chapter, he mentioned Abdullah ibn As-Samit. He likewise is a Badri. And now he's mentioned Itban ibn Malik al-Ansari. Who is also an uh, al-Badri. Radiyallahu anhum ajma'een. And as you know, the Sahaba who participated in the Battle of Badr, of course, have a special status in Al Islam. So, this hadith, dear brothers and sisters, this tremendous hadith, it shows you obviously the great virtue of Tawheed. And it shows you that a Tawheed saves you from the hellfire. If your Tawheed is complete and perfect, then it saves you from entering the hellfire. If your Tawheed and your Iman is deficient, then at the least, what we know for sure is that it will save you, the tohi that you do have, it will save you from eternally residing in the hellfire. Now, Okay. Uh, okay, dear brothers and sisters, in this hadith, one of the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah is mentioned. What is it? In this hadith, one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah is mentioned. And I'm not sure if that's a brother or sister, but someone in the chat, one of our brothers or sisters has mentioned ikhlas. Ikhlas, okay, excellent. Yes, sincerity. As you know, there are seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. And they're mentioned in poetry form by the great scholar Hafid ibn Ahmad al-Hakmi in his poem, Sullam uh, al-Wusul ila sama mabahith al-Usul, when he says, rahimahullah, wa bi shurutin sab'atin kad quyidat, wa fi nusus al-wahi haqqan waradat. He said that the kalimatu la ilaha illallah Seven conditions which have been mentioned in the Wahi revelation. For in who lam yan tafiqa iluha in notki illa hai to yastak miluha. 
The one who says La ilaha illallah will not benefit from La ilaha illallah unless he comes with these seven conditions. Al-ilmu wal-yaqinu wal-qabulu wal-inkiyadu fadri ma aqulu. Wal-ikhlasu wal-sidku wal-muhabba waffakaka Allahu lima ahabba. So in these two points he mentions Al-ilmu wal-yaqinu wal-qabulu wal-inkiyadi fadri ma aqulu. So he says Al-ilm, Al-yaqin, knowledge, certainty, kabul, acceptance, wal-inkiyadu, yani submission. Then he says wal-sidku wal-ikhlasu wal-mahabba. Sidq, truthfulness. Ikhlas, sincerity, mahabba to love. So these are several cases of La ilaha. One of them is mentioned here, which is al-ikhlas. That you say this kalima, seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say it in truth, with truthfulness, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all actions that you do, all statements that you utter, you make them for sincerely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what this condition means. So someone who commits shirk, then he's violated this condition. Because the, when the condition la ilaha illallah is al-ikhlas. Ikhlas wa deen lillah Azza wa Jal. Nah. So as we mentioned, dear brothers and sisters, that in this hadith, when Allah, when the Prophet said that Allah, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the hellfire haram upon the one who says, La ilaha illallah. As we said, this can mean two things. Haram here can mean two things. Yes, either entering it or either residing in it eternally. Because as we know, dear brothers and sisters, there are some muahidun, there are some muahidun who will enter the hellfire due to the sins or the major sins they have committed. And they will remain in there for a while for them to be purified, and then they shall enter Jannah. Okay? Then they shall enter Jannah. As for the Mushrikun and the Kuffar, they enter the hellfire and they remain in there forever. Why? Because Shirk. And kufr, it's so filthy that the hellfire cannot purify it. So therefore, they remain in there forever. So any, what I'm trying to say, dear brothers and sisters here, is that the people of Tawheed on Yom al Qiyamah are of different levels and of different types. Are of different levels and of different types. So, first category are those who will enter Jannah without Hisab and without Adab. They will enter Jannah without any reckoning and without any punishment. Second type of people, are those who will enter Jannah after Hisabun Yaseer, after an easy, easy reckoning. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَصَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا That he will surely receive an easy reckoning. And what is this reckoning? This is the reckoning, the accountability 
which the believer shall receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shields him from the rest of creation on the Yom al Qiyamah. And he, his records are presented to him, his good deeds are presented to him, his bad deeds are presented to him. He confirms and he affirms, he acknowledges his bad deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his vast mercy, he says, just as I shielded them for you in this in the akhirah, in, in the dunya, I will forgive for you in this dunya, in this, uh, sorry, in the akhirah, and you and there is allowed to enter Jannah. That's the easy reckoning. It's, it's called where the, your uh, yeah, any account is just presented to you. And you are not questioned about it. It's just presented to you. And those people also enter Jannah. The third category of people are those who are deserving of punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before they even enter the hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows No. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened there, but inshallah, you can still hear me. OK, now that was a third type of person, the th third type. The fourth type, dear brothers and sisters. Are those who are deserving of Allah's punishment. But Allah forgives them. Allah pardons them. Out of his vast mercy and they enter Jannah. Not due to Shafa'a. But Allah, out of His vast mercy, forgives them. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi, wa yaghfiru ma dun dhalik li man yasha." So whatever is less than shirk is under the will of Allah Tabarak wa Taala. If a person dies committing sins or not having repented, then he's under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah may choose to pardon him. Or punish him. If Allah pardons him, it's out of his vast mercy. If Allah punishes him, it's because of just, because Allah is the most just. So these four categories of people, the muwahidun, they will not even enter the hellfire. Walhamdulillah. Not at all. Then you have the fifth type. Who will enter the hellfire for a short period of time, be purified, and then they will enter Jannah. And they will enter Jannah. And even these people are not at the same level. Because the Prophet ﷺ explained as it comes in Hadith Sahih Muslim. That the Muwahidun who enter Jahannam, Hellfire, will exit Jahannam and enter Jannah in groups. So all of them will not end, exit Jahannam at the same time and then enter Jannah at the same time. No. Even they are different levels depending to how serious and evil the sins that they committed. And this, of course, refutes which deviant groups, dear brothers and sisters. The point we are talking about right now, the Muwahidun entering, some of the Muwahidun entering Jahannam for some of the sins they've committed and they're being allowed to enter Jannah after being purified. Who does this refute? Who does that refute? The Murji'ah? Or I think it's the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila. Because their belief is that if somebody enters Jahannam, he cannot exit. Yes, the fourth point, the fourth, are those who are deserving of Allah's punishment because they've committed sins or they haven't made tawbah before they died, but Allah forgives them and pardons them. So they don't enter Jahannam at all. 
Yes, because they use ayat such as wama hum bi kharijin the khawarij the mu'tazila they go to ayat some ayat which are for the kuffar and they apply to the muslims like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wama hum bi kharijin min an-nar they shall never exit the hellfire they use they apply that to the muslims who die upon sins And the Khawarij and Mu'tazila, you know, they deny shafa'a in the general sense. Intercession. Because they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ That they shall not benefit from the shafa'a of those who intercede. Again, these are ayat which are for the kuffar and they plan to put the Muslims. But we, Ahl al-Sunnati wal Jama'ah, Ahl al-Hadith wal Athar Salafiyun, our belief is that no, if a Muwahid enters Jahannam for a particular sin, then he shall, of course, due to the Tawheed that he has with him and the Iman, he will for sure exit Jahannam and enter paradise and then remain in paradise forever. And of course, it's from the virtues of Tawheed. You know, as there comes in a hadith in Sahil Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Anas radiyallahu an, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a person who said, la ilaha illallah, and in his heart, is Iman, faith, equal to the weight of a barley grain will exit the hellfire. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, whosoever says la ilaha illallah and in his heart is Iman equal to the weight of a wheat grain will exit Jahannam. Then the Prophet said, Whosoever says La ilaha illallah and in his heart is Iman equal to the weight of an atom or a small ant shall exit the hellfire. So this is a very strong refutation of the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila. And there are tens of ahadith, ayat, and tens of ahadith like this, and statements of the Salaf. Okay, so now we said, the Prophet Wasallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden Jahannam. For the one who says, La ilaha illallah, seeking by the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that one of the conditions mentioned is ikhlas. Seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this statement, it's a refutation of another group which has been mentioned, the Murji'a, who say that actions are not part of Iman, actions are not from Iman. Because in this hadith, it's showing us that you must have actions. Because if you say la ilaha illallah, seeking by the face of Allah, yani the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want the pleasure of Allah, how are you going to obtain the pleasure of Allah? You have to work for the pleasure of Allah. You have to do actions. You have to carry out acts of obedience, stay, from the, stay away from the haram. Otherwise, you're a liar. Can you imagine someone? Audhu Billah is committing zina. And he says, uh, I say, La ilaha illallah, I seek by the face of Allah. We say, you're kathabt, you're a liar. You have lied. Because if you are truly seeking the face of Allah, you wouldn't be doing this. So you're not seeking the face of Allah. Yani, you are not taking the means to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must have actions. So this hadith is a refutation of the Khawarij and the Mu'tazana from one angle, and it's a refutation of the Murji'ah from another angle, because it shows us we must have actions. 
And overall, this tremendous hadith shows us the great virtue and the great status of dying upon At-Tawheed. Okay, quickly moving on to the next hadith. We have two hadith, inshallah, we'll finish the chapter. Next hadith, when Abi Sa'id radiyallahu ta'ala an marfu'a, on the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qala Musa, Musa alayhi salam said, Ya Rabbi, O oh my Lord, Allimni shay'an adhkuruka wa ad'uka bih. My Lord, teach me something. Teach me something through, teach me something by way of it, yani, with which, teach me something with which I can remember you and supplicate to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qal, Kul ya Musa la ilaha illallah. O oh, Musa say la ilaha illallah. Qala ya Rabbi, kullu ibadika yakuluna hadha. Musa alayhi salam replied to Allah azza wa jalla. He said, ya Rabbi, O oh, my Lord, all of your servants say this. Now, all of your servants say this. Now, all of your servants say this. Qala ya Musa, the Allah SWT said, Ya Musa, O Musa, law anna samawati sab'a wa amira hunna ghayri. O Musa, if the seven heavens and all of its inhabitants other than me, wal aradina sab and the seven earths fi kiffa they were on one side of the scale wa la ilaha illa allah fi kiffa and la ilaha illa allah the other side of the scale malat bihinna la ilaha illa allah then la ilaha illa allah would outweigh all of that rawahu ibn hibban wal hakim wa sahahahu this had been reported by Ibn Hibban and Hakim, and Hakim declared it to be authentic. However, the correct opinion is because quite a lot of the scholars of hadith have mentioned that this hadith is weak. This hadith is weak. Although Al-Hafidh ibn Hajj rahimahullah in Fath al-Bari has authenticated it and some others have authenticated but a lot of the scholars have mentioned this hadith is weak. But that doesn't matter. Why? Because we have an authentic supporting hadith which is mentioned in the Musnad of Al-Imam Ahmad rahimahullah on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhumma that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when the death approached Nuh Alayhi Salam, when death approached Nuh Alayhi Salam, he said to his son, ilaha illallah. I command you with La ilaha illallah. Then he said, he said, if the seven heavens and the seven earth, if they were placed on one side of the scale, and la ilaha illallah is placed on the other side of the kiffa, on the other kiffa, on the other side of the scale. Rajahat bihinna la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah would outweigh all of that. 
So this authentic hadith supports the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an. And as we mentioned, dear brothers, in our introductory lessons, the Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, he doesn't ever, he doesn't mention in his book a hadith which is agreed upon its weakness. No. Uh, there will be a difference of opinion or there will be some supporting evidence from the Quran and the, or the Sunnah or from the Qawaid or the Usul of the Deen. And this is one such example. This is one such example. So this tremendous uh, hadith, hadith, this hadith as well, and the hadith of uh, Nuh alayhi salam, and the hadith of Abu Sayyid Khudri radiyallahu anhu, brothers and sisters, it shows you once again the greatness of Tawheed, the greatness of the Kalimat of Tawheed, the virtue of Tawheed, how heavy Tawheed is upon the scales. How heavy Tawheed is upon the scales. And a similar hadith to this table sister is the hadith of the bitaqa, the hadith of the card. The card which had has written on it, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad and Abduh wa Rasulu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That a man, he will come on Yom al Qiyamah and there will be 99 scrolls full of sins. Each scroll is as, as, is as far as the eye can, eyes can see. Subhanallah. So the man is going to look at these scrolls and obviously he's going to believe he's doomed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, do you have any hasanat? Do you have any good deeds? Obviously, when he sees that, he says, what? Yani, I, no, I have no good deeds. Yani, he's lost hope. He's, he's thinking, even if I had good deeds, any good deeds, how are these going to overcome these 99 scrolls? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bala, of course, today you shall not be wronged. And then a card shall be taken out. And on there is the Shahadatain. And he will say, What is this going to do for me, Ya Rabb? And then Allah subhanahu and then it will be placed on one side of the scale. And the 99 scrolls will be placed on the other side of the scale. And this bitaqa, this card saying, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give us a tawfiq to say that when the angel of death comes to us and when we are leaving this dunya, Ameen, Ameen, Ya Rab, all of us, Ameen, Ya Rab. And that will be placed on the scale and it will outweigh those 99 scrolls. So this is tawheed. This is the virtue of a tawheed. And how heavy tawheed is on Yom al -Qiyamah. Now, Let's just take some uh, side benefits, three or four side benefits from this hadith. So we've covered the main reason for this hadith to be mentioned in this bar because it shows you the virtues of Tawheed. So let's just mention three, four extra benefits which the scholars have mentioned before we move on to the next hadith. Here, Musa alayhi salam, he said, Oh my Lord, teach me something. Teach me something with which I can remember you and with which I can call upon you. What benefit can you take from this, dear brothers and sisters, this sentence? What benefit can we take? Feel free to write in the chat.
The virtue of dhikr, okay. Mashallah, very good benefit. So you see, alhamdulillah, we learn from each other. Yes, some of these benefits, uh, they did not cross my mind, but yes, it's a good benefit. Importance of knowing. Yes, again, very good benefit. To have knowledge. Eagerness of profit to worship. Yep, excellent, very good. Design for knowing more. Excellent, very good. Mashallah, I'm learning from you, brothers and sisters. Mashallah. Okay, the benefit that I had also in my mind was. That. Worship. Worship. And only Allah shows us exactly, yes. Yeah, and he, even the prophets and the messengers had to be taught, of course. It was wahi, revelation to them, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jibreel alayhi salam came and taught the Prophet how to pray. All the ahkam, all the rulings and regulations and ibadat and punishments and uh, the political and the social and the economic uh, system of Islam. Everything came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a refutation on the, on the Mubtadi'ah. The how the Sufis and Ahl al bidah they will invent a dhikr from themselves. And here we have Musa alayhi salam asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teach me. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet in the Quran, he says, وَاتَّبِئْ مَا يُوحَا إِلَيْهِ وَاتَّبِئْ مَا يُوحَا إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ Follow, O Muhammad sallallahu that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. The Prophet sallallahu mission was to just convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was under the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here, obviously, Musa alayhi salam wanted something special for him, yes? He wanted something special because it's human nature that you have something which is specific to you. Like the humans desire that, they have this desire to have something on, only for them that nobody else <laughs> knows. And that's natural. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? Say la ilaha illa. So, so, so Musa alayhi salam said, teach me something with which I can remember you, do dhikr of you, and call upon you, make dua with it. Now, Dhikr is wadih because the Prophet وسلم, said, Afdalu dhikr la ilaha illallah. The best dhikr is la ilaha illallah. So we know how we can do dhikr, remember Allah with la ilaha illallah. But what about dua? So the scholars have mentioned dua. As you might know from Usul al Thalatha, there's two types Dua al Mas'ala or Dua al Ibadah. Dua al Mas'ala or Dua al Ibadah. Dua al Mas'ala is when you ask Allah, Ya Rabbi, Igfirli, Ya Rabbi, Urzukni, Awlad and Salihin, Ya Rabbi, Zidni, Ilman, whatever, yes. You're asking Allah SWT or something. This is Dua al Ibadah, the, the Dua that we normally do. Sorry, Dua al Mas'ala. And then you have Dua al Ibadah, which is what? When you do any act of worship, you are indirectly asking Allah, Oh Allah, reward me. Alayhi Oh Allah, accept from me. Oh Allah, reward for and 
you know, enter me Jannah, enter me to Jannah because of it, yes? So in the same way when you say La ilaha illallah, you are indirectly asking Allah, Ya Allah, I'm saying La ilaha illallah, accept it from me, reward me for it, yes? Forgive my sins because of it and enter me into Jannah because of it. You are not saying it with your tongue. You are saying it indirectly. You are asking Allah the most great to reward you. Okay, so there is dua which we and you make with our tongue physically, and this dua which we make from the state and the situation that we are in. Okay. Where will the video be posted, inshallah? The videos are normally posted, my dear brother, on uh, Markaz Umar Khattab YouTube channel. All our videos of all our lessons. And uh, you will, they will also post it in our Telegram group. Yeah, they will also post it on our Telegram group, Markaz Umar Telegram group, inshallah. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, say, La ilaha illallah, this shows you again the virtues, La ilaha illallah, said, after the dhikri, La ilaha illallah, the Prophet said, the best of dhikr is La ilaha illallah. Okay, alayhi kadalik, naam, bala. Again, this shows the virtue of tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have chosen anything. And he said to him, say, La ilaha illallah. Shows you the great virtues of tawheed. And Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, you know, he said, he replied and he said, my Lord, all of your servants say that. Never did Musa alayhi salam think anything yani, that, that la ilaha illallah is, uh, yani, is not as virtuous, not as virtuous as it is. It's not that Musa alayhi salam thought anything less or didn't know the status of la ilaha illallah. Okay is that he just wanted something which was specific to him, as I've mentioned before. Okay. All right. So these are just a couple of... Uh, and also, dear brothers and sisters, from the hadith of Nuh alayhi salam upon his deathbed when he said to his son Muruka bi la ilaha illallah I command you with la ilaha illallah then he showed him the virtue of la ilaha illallah how heavy la ilaha illallah is on the scales what benefit can we what's the main what's uh, uh, yani, one of the main benefits we could take from this hadith then inshallah move, we'll move on to our final hadith. What do you think? Excellent, okay. The importance of teaching our children Tawheed, yes, very good. And reminding them of Tawheed. Never too late to say it, yes, okay, excellent, yep. So here it is Nuh alayhi salam who was leaving this dunya. It shows us what we've mentioned before, dear brothers and sisters, in our introductory lessons. Excellent, yes. Very good point. The beginning of his call and the end and middle was the same for 950 years. Yes, excellent, mashallah. Yep. 
That's the main point as well. Very good. Yes. That the call of the prophets and the messengers from the day they were sent as a prophet or a messenger or both until they passed away. The emphasis was and the da'wah, it revolved around Tawheed. So here we have Nuh alayhi salam on his deathbed. Advising his son with la ilaha illallah. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says by Ya'qub alayhi salam, Am kuntum shuhada'a, idh hadara Ya'qub al-mawt. Were you there when death came to Ya'qub alayhi salam? Idh qala li banihi. When he said to his children, What are you going to worship after me? They said, We will worship your Lord and the Lord of Ibrahim and the Lord of Ismail and the Lord of Ishaq. The one Lord. And to him we have submitted. On, the de- on, on his deathbed, he's asking them this. He's asking his offspring on his deathbed what they will worship after he's left this dunya. And as you know, the well known hadith of the Prophet and the Prophet was also in yani, the last moments of his life. وسلم, he said, Laanatullahi al Yahudi wa Nasara, Ittahadu kubura anbiya him masajid. May the curse of Allah be upon the Yehud and the Nasara and the Christians who took the play, who took the graves of their prophets as places of worship. So this is what this uh, this is what this hadith shows us. Okay. Moving on to the last hadith here, brothers and sisters, very quickly. Okay, it's a short hadith. The author, Rahimahullah, says, Wale Tirmidhi wa Hassanahu, reported by Tirmidhi, who said it's Hassan. And Anas radiyallahu an, on the authority of Anas radiyallahu anhu, called Smith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I heard the Masha of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Qala Allahu ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, so this is a hadith Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Yabna Adam, <coughs> O son of Adam, <coughs> sorry, Inna kalau ataytani bi qurab al ardi khataya, if you were to meet me with sins full of earth, yani, yani, earth full of sins, any sins which fill the entire earth. Then you met me not having associated anyone or anything in worship with me. I will will come to you with the same amount of forgiveness. With the same amount of forgiveness. This is... uh, Another tremendous hadith today, brothers and sisters. And it shows you the virtues, the, the great virtue of Tawheed. And it shows you once again how Tawheed leads to the forgiveness of sins. In fact, this is the last part of this hadith. Before that, there are two more sentences. So the hadith starts when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, says Yabna Adam, Innaka ma da'utani wa rajawutani ghafartu laka ala ma kana mink wa la ubali. O son of Adam, as long as you call upon me and have hope in me, I will forgive your sins, whatever they are. And I don't mind. Yabna Adam, Lo Balagat Dunubuka, Anana Sama. 
ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك ولا أبالي O son of Adam if your sins reach the clouds and then you sought forgiveness from me I will forgive you and I don't mind then Allah SWT said this what we mentioned now O son of Adam if you were to meet me with sins the amount of which you fill the entire earth that's how many sins you come with me then you meet me on yawm al qiyama not having done any shirk i will come to you the same amount of forgiveness so this hadith <coughs> dear brothers and sisters it shows you the three greatest means of the forgiveness of sins number 1 supplicating while having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number 2 istighfar seeking forgiveness number 3 at tawheed and from all of these three tawheed is the greatest means for forgiveness it is greater means for forgiveness than dua and raja and it's a greater means for forgiveness than istighfar and tauba yani there's nothing that comes close to tawheed In fact, without Tawheed, there is no hope in forgiveness. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah doesn't forgive that partners be associated with him, associated with him in worship. So if, you, if, a, if a someone is engrossed in shirk and day and night he's calling upon Allah, and hoping in Allah and seeking Allah's forgiveness from the sins that he commits like stealing drinking backbiting but at the same time he's engrossed in worshiping other than Allah going to the graves and asking the dead for help and so on and so forth what's going to benefit him Okay. So this hadith that's what it shows you. The great virtues of tawhid and that tawhid is the greatest means of forgiveness of sins. Just imagine first dear brothers and sisters a person on his deathbed and he seeks repentance for his sins. Of course Tawbah, it wipes out your sins. If you meet the conditions of Tawbah and you're sincere in your Tawbah on your deathbed, Allah will forgive you. Also, if you have an individual who before dying, he renews his Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, he says la ilaha illallah with complete truthfulness and complete certainty yakin and complete ikhlas sincerity this by far is a greater hasana than the tauba this by far will remove your sins and burn your sins more than tauba because the hasana of tawhid is greater than the hasana of tauba if a tauba leads is such a great means for the forgiveness of sins then tawhid is greater than it then tawhid is greater than even tauba if it is said with full conviction complete certainty with ikhlas atam a sidq atam and this this noor it will burn any sin that stands in its way however 
Is it for everyone and anybody? No. It's got a heavy condition attached to it, which is what? Yeah, you meet me completely free of any type of shirk. It's no shirk akbar, no shirk asghar, no riya, no showing off. Nasallallahu Uh, not a Nabi, not an angel, not a stone, not a tree, not a rock, not a mountain, not a cave. Yani you come to Allah Azza wa Jal completely stripped of all types of shirk, pure upon Tawheed. Upon Tawheed. Yes, this is the condition. Then, of course, Allah is going to come to you and forgive all your sins. But if your Tawheed is deficient, then, of course, we mentioned this at the beginning, dear brothers and sisters. Um, if your Tawheed is deficient, then what? Then any virtue. Which has been mentioned in the Quran, the Sunnah regarding Tawheed, will also be deficient for you. If you want the virtue or the virtue of Tawheed in full, your Tawheed has to be full. If your Tawheed decreases or is weak or deficient, then according to your Tawheed, it will be the amount of virtues or the amount of a particular virtue that you shall attain. So you want full and complete forgiveness? Then come with full and complete Tawheed. Otherwise, you will get the forgiveness according to the level of your Tawheed and your Iman. And this is why we mentioned before, if someone has complete and perfect Tawheed in, 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 his, uh, uh, in his heart, and he, his Tawheed is perfect and complete and it's free of all types of shirk. Yes, complete Tawheed, dear brothers and sisters, you will see the effects of it on your body parts. So, you will not be committing major sins anyway, nor will you be persistent upon committing minor sins. And we all Bani Adam, we all make mistakes. If you do fall into a mistake or a sin, you will rush to make Tawbah. So a person who lives his life like this anyway, us, he's going to get the full forgiveness. Or as we have mentioned, a person on his deathbed, he says, La ilaha illallah. Allah gives him the tawfiq. Yeah, subhanallah, they, I heard, I mean, it's not a story. <laughs> We're not storytellers, like some du'at. This is something real that happened. I'll just mention it. It just came to my mind. A few days ago, is someone in Riyadh, two young boys, wasalam, it makes your hair stand on end. Two young boys, they had, I think they were Saudis. Uh, they had a very bad car accident. And uh, very young, very young. So who related this story is the one who survived. And one of them who was dying, he bled to death. Nasrullah, he bled to death. His friend said that, you know, he kept saying to me, he said he kept saying to me while he was dying, he said, I don't pray because I don't want to die. I want to pray. I've been missing my prayers. I want to pray. 
And this friend said, I said to him, say, La ilaha illallah, say, La ilaha illallah. And he goes, he just couldn't say it. A'udhu billah. He could not say it and he died. So don't, we shouldn't take this for granted. That, oh, when we are dying, we say, La ilaha illallah. No. Live your life upon the La ilaha illallah, dear brothers and sisters. Don't wait for that moment. Now worship Allah while you have the opportunity. You think it's that easy? You have to work for La ilaha illallah. You have to live your life according to La ilaha illallah. You have to fulfill the conditions of La ilaha illallah. It's not going to happen just like that. And this is why the scholars say that if someone on his deathbed says La ilaha illallah with full yaqeen, full sidq, complete ikhlas, he is the one who will come a Yom Al-Qiyamah with this great virtue that all sins will be forgiven and all the sins will, and this is going to be so powerful. But how many people are going to reach that? How many people are going to be able to say La ilaha illallah? Then how many are going to be able to say it with that kind of conviction? And if a person has spent his life sinning and committing shirk and bidah and khurafat, It's in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. If that person will be granted that opportunity or not. And if a person is not granted the opportunity, then he's to blame himself. Because he didn't live his life accordingly. And that is a lesson. And to finish off, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, That a servant, he cannot be safe from major shirk and minor shirk, except if the tawheed in his heart is correct and sound, and except if he has submitted to Allah inwardly. And outwardly, yani with actions. So don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. And subhanallah, I to finish with this. The other day I heard a clip from our Shaykh Shaykh Salih Sindhi Hafidahullah. He mentioned this hadith. It's mentioned by Al Imam Ibn Kathir. Rahimahullah is tafsir. And uh, Ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah, he said, Isnad la ba'asa bihi. And the Isnad is okay. And he said, that hadith, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Subhanallah. Yani, I'm paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing, that there are angels, dear brothers and sisters, that Either, I'm mistaken, either since uh, Allah created them, the angels, or I'll check, but I'll check again to confirm. Either since Allah created them, or since Allah created the heavens and the earth, they have been in sujood. Allahu Akbar. They have been in sujood since that day. And there are other angels who since that day have been ruku'ah. And they will not come out of, out of those positions until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when they come out of those positions and they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what they're going to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So imagine this, dear brothers and sisters, and then think of our hal. Think of our state. Who do we think we are?
they will say Subhanak. Glory be to you. Ma abadanaka haqq al ibadah. Allahu Akbar. They will say, We didn't worship you as you ought to be worshipped. We didn't worship you as to deserve as you deserve to be worshipped. So we walking around <laughs> with our chests out, deceived, foolish, deluded, thinking <laughs> that we have achieved so much. Wallahi, we are so deficient. And we need to work on ourselves now. Before, while we have the opportunity, while we have health, first and foremost, and while we are alive. The advice to myself first and to you, brothers and sisters, that we need to get on with it now before it's too late. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and forgive our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us ikhlas in statement and in action and to purify our intentions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from riya and sum'ah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. To accept. We don't have a guarantee. That Allah has accepted our actions. We just hope. So we make dua to Allah that He accepts our actions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us and grant us husn al khatima. That's why Shaykh al Islam ibn Baz rahmatullahi alayhi used to say all the time, he used to say, make dua all the time. He said, he used to make, he just say, he used to. Advised, always make dua for a good end. Meaning upon Tawheed and upon Sunnah and upon Tawbah and upon La ilaha illallah. And with this we conclude, Alhamdulillah, we finished the second chapter. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Fi awwalihi wa akhirihi. If you brothers and sisters have any questions or any comments, then we can uh, take some maximum five minutes. We leave. <clears throat> What's your advice for people looking to get married in the West? Okay, this is off the topic, but nevertheless, okay. Uh, I mean, the advice is the advice of the Prophet and the Salaf and the Ulama that look for a righteous wife, a wife who is upon the correct aqeedah, a wife who prays her five daily prayers, a wife who fasts Ramadan, a wife who remembers Allah and fears Allah. You know, a sister that carries out her obligations, tries the best to carry obligations, stays away from haram as much as she can. Sister of good character. And also a sister that you are physically attracted to. There should be an element of physical attraction. Uh, no doubt. But. 
There's no perfection. Don't look for perfection. Men are not perfect, nor are women. Don't demand too much. And because there's no perfection. Saddidu wa qaribu. Do your best. Do istikhara. Make dua to Allah. First of all, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And consult those who are close to you, who wish good for you. And don't spread the news so people don't give you evil eye. Yani, these things are not announced. You know, close family, close friends who you can consult and trust, consult them. Consult them and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't be too paranoid. <laughs> okay. When you see little things any, in a sister or something in, in an interview or whatever. Any, don't be paranoid and don't. Uh, there's no perfection. As I said, there's no brother that's perfect, no sister that's perfect. Yes, yeah, sister, good sister, of good character, chaste, humble, shy, feminine, female, who fears Allah and is upon the correct aqeedah. Doesn't have to be a talib at al-ilm. If she is, that's a bonus. If she isn't, any khair, inshallah, she will learn with you. You can teach her. You can learn together and then teach your children. Generations to come. In the previous barakallah, in the previous hadith, what are the seven earths referred to? I didn't quite understand that. Allah knows best. As scholars have mentioned different interpretations. Are there physically seven earths? Or is that something else? I can't remember the explanation of that. Allah knows best. But I know there is a difference of opinion or different interpretations to that. That's all I vaguely remember, but the details I don't remember. But the point is, I show you the virtue of Tawheed, that Tawheed will outweigh seven heavens, seven earths, whatever is in them and whatever is between them. Barakallahu feek. Okay, brothers and sisters, have a nice week. And inshallah, we see you same time next week. Bi'ithnillahi jalla wa ala. Allahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa nabina wa habibina Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa ali wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh